Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Patrick Malloy. I am the Dean of the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. And as many of you know, um, we're doing an entire series of webinars to help us to prepare for the upcoming election, all examining uh, issues of note, uh, particularly from an Episcopal perspective. You will remember that we began with one on immigration issues, then one on white Christian nationalism, then one on reproductive issues, and now today we're going to talk about the environment. Uh, and I'm delighted that my uh, dialogue partner today is Dr. Andrew Thompson, who uh, is a professor of ethics at the University of the South, also called SWANI, uh, and at the seminary there, one of our best seminaries. Um, he also is the director of the Center for Religion and the Environment, which makes him absolutely the perfect person to be uh, my dialogue partner today. Um, we are going to approach this dialogically um, with a special attention as we have been to the positions of the Episcopal Church. Uh, you will find in the chat uh, a document, a PDF of a doc, link to a PDF of a document uh, that will take you to general convention resolutions, especially related to the environment and, and, and associated issues, uh, running all the way back amazingly to 1991. So you might use that as, as a reference. Um, if you'd like, you'll see at the bottom of your screen that there's a Q&A button. Uh, you may, if you would like, uh, enter uh, questions there. Uh, then Dr. Thompson and I will be able to see them, and then we will uh, surface as many of those um, as is possible. So, uh, Dr. Thompson, um, welcome to the series. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Yes, and it's an honor for us to have you. And I, I already told Dr. Thompson this, but I'll tell the rest of you this. I don't do ethics. Those of you who know me know that, that academically I, I do liturgy. Um, and so um, I um, read Dr. Thompson's work to prepare for this um, so I wouldn't come off seeming totally imbecilic. Uh, and um, I expected um, Dr. Thompson to be writing about things like the importance of um, clean water and making sure that we um, don't destroy ecosystems because God created them after all, and we have responsibility to the creator God. Um, and I was delighted within pages uh, of, of the beginning of that book to realize that's not at all really what Dr. Thompson does, though it's not disconnected from that. So, um, Dr. Thompson, um, it seems to me that when you write about the environment, uh, you write um, about um, social and uh, anthropological issues more than you do about um, biological issues, uh, though all things are, are, are related. I wonder if you could just say a word about, in your mind, what what is your project? What what are you trying to do? Um, thank you. That's an excellent question. So I'll say that part of how I come to that approach, because you're absolutely right, that is um, how I think about environmental issues. And part of that started with graduate school, with my my research as a graduate student. I'm from West Virginia, and uh, my dissertation was about mountaintop removal, coal mining from a Christian perspective. And what really drew me to that issue was the way it brought in issues of economics, of class, of social division, of of identity, the way that people understand themselves and their families and their history um, in really profound ways. And so starting from that, um, that's kind of always been the lens that I bring to environmental issues. And more recently, and, and with this, the, the book that, that you're mentioning, um, my focus has really been especially on issues of race, uh, racism and colonialism, and how those intersect with environmental issues. Um, I think it's also the case that the Episcopal Church's more recent focus on environmental issues has has reflected that that kind of attention as well. The way that other things that matter deeply to the church, social justice, economic justice, racial justice, the way that um, all of those are tied up with environmental issues and environmental justice as well. So I think um, I really see my work as as trying to articulate those connections and and in particular really listening to scholars of color to indigenous scholars and, and others who speak from those perspectives, but to try to understand how we as a church can can really hear those those critiques and um, try to begin to respond to them by unpacking our own history, our own complicity uh, in that. 
Well, let's, let's ex explore that a bit. I, I think we're all, you know, very aware of one of one of the issues I would think related to the environment is climate change, uh, and in particular, the disturbances that that's causing. Um, the great, you, you're in Tennessee right now, um, and you live and work there. And I know that Tennessee has just been hit very hard, some parts of it, by the, the most recent storm. Um, I, I, I don't quite understand what that has to do with race. So, um, if I were in the the southeastern part of our country and and in 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 the storm we're approaching, what difference would it make? What color I am? Hmm. So the the first thing to to point to in the cases that you describe, um, first Hurricane Helene uh, a couple weeks ago, and now um, the current hurricane, is the way that social organization and political decisions really do shape those impacts. I don't know if you've seen, but there's there's been some reporting recently on, for example, how um, development and zoning policies in Western North Carolina have shaped the way that 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 the flooding impacts were felt from from Hurricane Helene. So what seems like just a climatological, physiological kind of um, or, or physical kind of uh, question really is shaped by political forces, political dynamics. Now, in the case of these particular hurricanes, I I don't know enough to know if um, racial dynamics were part of, of the climate impacts in these cases. But it is the case, clearly, globally, that the impacts of climate change, this, this global phenomenon, are disproportionately felt along racial and colonial lines. So first, globally, um, studies have shown that countries that have that were colonized are more likely to experience more devastating effects of climate change than countries that colonized. Not not across the board, but on average, um, they they have a higher cl climate vulnerability in countries that that were uh, colonized, that were the victims of colonization. But also, just within countries within the United States. Um, there have been all kinds of, of ways that those impacts have been disproportionately felt by, by communities of color. So one example is the earliest climate refugees, the earliest folks who were displaced by climate change, by sea level rise specifically, were the Ile de Jean Charles um, band of Native Americans in Louisiana. And they lost their uh, their ancestral home on the, the coast there because of sea level rise. So that's one clear example where um, where where race and coloniz colonialism have shaped the impacts of climate change. Um, there actually has also, there was a study done in New York City that demonstrated even something as simple, as basic as heat is disproportionately distributed within a city. So within New York City over a certain period of time, they found that uh, communities of color were more likely to experience extreme heat and and mortality and morbidity from extreme heat than uh, than than communities that were not communities of color. Um, so so even within a city, the way something that seems as purely physical, purely scientific as as uh, extreme heat um, still is distributed along racially uh, disproportionate lines. So people who are white then in general um, are less impacted by the current environmental crisis than people who are not white. Yeah. Which leads me to a, a, a topic and a question that actually has come up now in two of the other uh, webinars. And, and that is the one with um, Ray Suarez about immigration, and then the one with Pamela Cooper White about white Christian nationalism. So we said that you know white people fare better. I I'm wondering if you could tell me what a white person is. What is whiteness? Because the notion of whiteness figures significantly in your work. Yeah. So are you a white? Am I a, a white person? Are you a white person? And who who determines what is that? And who determines what that is? Yeah, it's it's such an excellent and and complex question, and. What it's 
what attention to to whiteness and to using the the category of whiteness is is really trying to articulate is the way that um, certain perspectives, certain experiences are privileged, are normative. And by explicitly naming whiteness as such, that calls attention to the fact that um, those are not universal experiences. They're not everyone's experiences in the way that they have, have often been portrayed. Um, and so by calling attention to whiteness and to how white the idea of whiteness is constructed, that raises awareness that that calls our attention to to the fact that it doesn't have to be constructed the way that it is, that there's nothing natural about it. There's certainly nothing biological about whiteness itself, um, that it is a social construction just as much as as race itself is a is a social construction as as well as gender and other kinds of of socially constructed categories. Um, and and what that does by um by by focusing attention in that way, as I say, it it reminds us that it didn't doesn't have to be constructed the way that it is. If you look at um the history of of race, the history of whiteness, you can see how different groups have been included or excluded within that category, right? So what may have once seemed like a straightforward kind of biological category, right, um, is in fact really a construction that's used to maintain power, maintain privilege for some people as opposed to other people. And so who who gets into that category, who counts as white, has always kind of been a contested thing. Um, and, and so some groups, you know, historically were not understood as white and now are, or vice versa. Um, so, so all that's a, a complicated answer to your question. Um, I... I I would say that someone like me is someone who has has historically been constructed as white, but I think it's important to to name that 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 is you know that that's a, a construction, and that it serves to maintain certain privileges and certain kind of um, normative perspective. I'm I'm aware I, when when I was a kid, I, we've talked about this before. I didn't grow up in West Virginia, but I grew up across a river from West Virginia. Um, in a in a sort of a, a very isolated part of Maryland, and in the little town where I grew up, everyone was Irish except my family, my my mother's family, who were Italian. Mm -hmm. And I really think that the Irish people doubted that my my uh, mother's family were white. I think. Yeah. Well, right. That's that's exactly um, an example. Kelly Brown Douglas uh, describes almost exactly that that story of um, Italian immigrants in the early. United States uh, having to sort of claim their whiteness so that they could be included in that kind of privilege um, rather than than excluded as non-white. And that just demonstrates how constructed and how in flux um, that category has has always been. And the fact that that what it really exists to do is not not sort of as a descriptor, but um, as a way of, of preserving a certain social organization. Right. I, I would think that there are a number of groups that I think universally probably would have been considered not white. And I'd like to talk about one of them now because I'd like to get back to the, the issue of the environment and in ecology. And I think one of those groups would be indigenous American people. Yeah. I think that, that um, they're not being white is essential to the colonial project. Um, and then that has a lot to do with with what happened to their land and their own ecology. Yeah. And I was especially not to get ahead out of, out ahead of myself, but um, in your book you tell this I found absolutely fascinating story about this uh, the Jesuit missions in Mexico and in particular this Father Acosta you you mentioned. So I've just thrown a lot of stuff at you, but I wonder if you could talk about how it is. Um, that the issue, this this question of race, and then we'll get to supersessionism, but the issue of um, race um, allowed us to, us European types, to, to conquer the indigenous um, Americans. And then um, how exactly that gets us back to the question of environment? Hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so I'll start with the question about um, Jose de Acosta. He was actually a, a Peruvian Jesuit minister, uh, missionary. Um, and what he was faced with essentially was the task of trying to understand how this supposed new world that they had had supposedly discovered 
how to incorporate that into the existing theological cosmology, how to, how to incorporate that into their view of God's creation and providence of the world. Um, they had a, had an understanding of what the world was and how God was involved in that. And all of a sudden, from their perspective, here comes this, this whole new continent with all kinds of resources and people who have never, you know, encountered the Christian God as they understood it. Um, and so what Acosta does, part of how he wraps his mind around that and, and theologically tries to help others wrap their mind around that is to, to claim that God in God's providence um, endowed these, these again, to, to their mind, uncivilized peoples with uh, vast natural resources so that the Europeans would come and colonize them and supposedly civilize them and save them again from their from their perspective that um, that that this was part of God's plan to bring the gospel to these uh, newly discovered lands um, that that was all part of of God's providence. That's how Acosta justified the the colonial uh, colonialist practices that they were involved in. And uh, I should say uh, Willie James Jennings describes this in in great detail in his book The Christian Imagination. Together with that, you have um, what becomes known as the doctrine of discovery. And uh, I, I think you mentioned that that has come up in, in previous uh, webinars as well. Yes, I think we, I think we discussed it even um, in this, the, far, the first one with Ray Suarez. Yeah, it did. And we referred to the general convention document that, that uh, denounced it. That's right. Yeah. And, and the Episcopal Church was among the first churches to, to really come out and reject the doctrine of discovery. The doctrine of discovery... Um, was this idea based on a couple of papal bulls that gave the European countries, specifically Spain, Spain and Portugal, um, gave them claim to these supposedly newly discovered lands. And, and it was the, the Pope's endorsement that this was all part of God's uh, providential plan for the Europeans to colonize these lands. And remarkably, that creates a precedent that continues to operate as a legal precedent in some ways up till in, until the 20th century, um, which that, I mean, we, we think of this as, as colonial history as centuries ago, um, but that was a precedent that was continued to, to be invoked for, for centuries after the colonial period. Um, and and I, I should mention here a, a book called Unsettling Truths by Mark Charles and Sung Chan Ra that really goes into um, the theological origins and implications of, of the doctrine of discovery. As you said, the Episcopal Church um, has, has officially denounced the doctrine of discovery as, as essentially as heresy, as, as, um, as incorrect theology. But even where it's not still invoked as directly, explicitly as legal precedent, it also has continued to shape um, much of how those of us who, who have descended from colonizers view the land, um, viewing it as, you know, as a place that's sort of open for the taking, uh, as, you know, particularly in the early days of the conservation movement, the sense that um, the land before the white people got here was pristine, untouched, um, this untrammeled wilderness, and that that's something that we, as as white people, uh, need to protect, right? A lot of that is is wrapped up in the philosophy uh, that's that's sort of expressed in um, the doctrine of discovery, and and I would mention one claim that that Charles and Ra make in their book Unsettling Truths is that yes, many churches have denounced the doctrine of discovery. To a certain extent, those denunciations ring hollow if we're not also willing to ask questions about how to return land that we occupy as as the church land that we occupy to the people who, who originally inhabited or, or lived off of that land. And so, so really questions of land restitution, of giving the land back, um, they argue that until the church is willing to take those kind of questions seriously, the formal denunciations are, are just the beginning. They're just a first step. Well, a couple of questions. First of all, um, one that's meant to be a bit provocative, um, but but that's ridiculous. I mean, we've built 
these remarkable neo-Gothic buildings on that land. We just can't give the land back. I mean, we're Episcopalians after all. We, you know, our buildings are the most important thing to us. Yeah. So what exactly, um, so what do you, what do you, what do we do about this totally impractical suggestion? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> um, because I think that that is obviously that's the 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 typical sort of knee-jerk response, right? Is just practically like how how would you do something like this? Um but I think it's important to 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 go a little bit further than that, to to actually entertain the question, because it turns out there are a number of kind of creative ways that that question has been engaged, that 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 communities and institutions really have um practically found some ways to 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 restore the land to um to the communities or to the descendants of the communities that that would have been there from the start so whether that's um kind of cooperative uh land ownership or ways of giving kind of meaningful control to the descendants of of the the communities that may have been there but there are a lot of creative forms of this that don't involve just kind of handing over the title because you know, they probably wouldn't even want your Gothic cathedrals, right? Um, the crucial thing, though, is to actually ask the question, to actually um, entertain the possibility, not, you know, that's so impractical, that's not something that could ever happen, but what if it was something that could happen? What might that look like, right? To start to engage it from that perspective and really crucially to, to from the very start, to engage in conversation with the communities that, and, and the descendants of the communities that that would have been impacted, right? The the ones with whom, the ones to whom we owe this this kind of restitution, um, from the start to to engage with them to ask what what those folks would want, what what a reasonable kind of restitution would look like. But I think um, as long as our knee jerk response is to say, well, that's impossible, so we can't even consider it, then we're going to close ourselves off to some of those creative possibilities that really do exist. Have you seen it happen? Uh, not not personally, no, but I've read accounts of of where it's been done. Um, I'm going to ask you now if, if the General Convention has said anything about this that you know. But in the meantime, um, one uh, of our participants here has, in the question and answer session, posted some resources from our church and asked that they be shared. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, post those those links in the chat for people who would like to uh, for people who would like to reference this material. And I give thanks um, that we have been given these. So I'm having, I'm going to have to grab a, a keyboard from the other side of my desk here to be able to do this. But in the meantime, could you say whether the general convention has said anything about this? As far as I'm aware, uh, no, this is not, um, not a topic that has gone through a, 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 and been passed in a general convention resolution. Um, on the, the task forces, the interim bodies that uh, general convention creates, to uh, carry out some of its environmental resolutions, the idea of environmental reparations, which is uh, which includes this idea of land restitution, but also addresses um, environmental forms of reparations for other historical injustices like slavery. Um, that whole concept of environmental reparations has been a part of conversations around the church's environmental ministry, and I I hope that that uh, continues to be the case. Um, there's there's a lot of uh, energy and investment in in thinking about that question, but uh, as far as I know, it has not shown up in formally in a, a resolution. So I mentioned before supersessionism because I think supersessionism uh, is in, in in an odd sort of way is somewhat related to the doctrine of discovery um, and how it allows us to move in the world, yeah. um, and um, it's really. It's a really important topic right now, considering the rise in anti-Semitism yeah. uh, around the world, and especially in the United States, um, some of which is is disguised as being pro-Palestinian, and that is certainly a, a worthy cause, but some of it is just blatant anti-Semitism. Um, and we Christians are responsible for all of that, really, um, for, for, for at least for a great deal of it in the West. I wonder if you could say supersessionism is, is an idea that many people understand, but they might not know the term. So I wonder if you could talk about uh, supersessionism, what it has to do with the conquest of the world by by white colonializers, um, and what that has to do um, with uh, our use of the earth. Is that too much? To, is that too much? I think I can do it. 
And and so again, uh, Willie James Jennings, his book, The Christian Imagination, and then a, also an article that he wrote on um, on creation theology are really excellent resources for thinking about this. And, and most of what I have to say comes from him. Um, but the claim is, first, supersessionism is, of course, the the idea that Christians and the Christian church fully replace the people of Israel from, from the Old Testament. Um, that can be a complicated idea, right? And, and often um, delineating just where sort of the boundaries of, of that kind of supersessionism might be is can can be complicated and sort of nuanced but but generally it is the idea that um essentially that the people of israel the nation of israel in in, the, in terms of the biblical nation are no longer relevant to the story of god's salvation that the christian church um, completely sort of takes their place and and of course that is um completely and unbiblical and and untheological and and could i say and our church has actively denounce that absolutely right one of uh, the few, really i mean most churches have not denounced that yeah right yeah thank you um so what that has to do with both the doctrine of discovery and with the environment jennings argues that what happens in supersessionist theology and supersessionist logic is god's salvation history, God's plan for, for humanity becomes completely detached from both the people and the place of Israel. And it becomes abstract. It becomes something that can be transferable, in this case, transferred to uh, the Christian church and, and typically in the history of colonialism, transferred to the white European Christian church. And the idea that that's transferable, that is no longer t connected to a particular people in a particular place affects the way that we see other people and other places, right? They become, according to Jennings' argument, they become sort of commodified. They become interchangeable, right? They are, they are and and if they are not the chosen people, and, and in this case with all the colonialist kind of implications of that, then they are resources simply to be exploited. And that applies equally to the people and to the land. And so you can see how that then relates to the idea of the doctrine of discovery, that that these newly discovered, in quotes again, people and places um, simply are resources to, to be used up. And in fact, again, going back to Acosta's uh, claims that God wants the colonizers to to exploit them, right, to, to use them up. Um, and as I say, you know, then that that kind of thinking without some of the, the the theological overtones, but that kind of thinking continues to to shape much of our approach to um, to the environment, to the to the non-human or more than human world. So it would it would seem that if if Jews are not the chosen people any longer, but Christians are, and at least in at the time of, of the time of discovery, that meant white Europeans. So right. white Europeans now are the chosen people, then everyone else is completely other but also their resources are completely other. And so then we can exploit not only, as you said, their pe the people, but also their land and their other natural resources just at will, because after all, we are the chosen people and they're commodified. Right, yes. If you if you look at the Old Testament, the, the idea of the covenant, throughout the Old Testament, multiple places, the covenant is between God and Israel, between God and God's people and the land. And and often there there are various ways that that's invoked, but the land is invoked as as a witness to the covenant, as a party to the covenant. So the consequences of breaking the covenant often affect the land, and um, either involve the destruction of the land or the removal of the people from the land. Right. So the land, throughout the the, the Old Testament and and the covenant with Israel, the land is a part of that the whole time, and and a, an active part of that in some really interesting ways. And so, yeah, what supersessionism does is remove the story of salvation from all of that, not just people, not just the nation of Israel, but but from the land as well. And all of that becomes essentially, um, yeah, uh, exploitable. So as long as we're talking about the, the Jewish covenant, um, this past Sunday here at the cathedral, we celebrated St. Francis Day as we do. And you probably know it's a an enormous event, you know, there are thousands, literally thousands of people here on, on Sunday. I preached, 
And I made reference extensively to the third Eucharistic prayer, Eucharistic prayer C. And for those of you who are not Episcopalians, the Eucharistic prayer um, is the is the prayer at the center of our Holy Communion service. And up until the 1970s, there was one um, that was used every time we celebrated Holy Communion. And then in the 1979 Book of Common Prayer, there were really four, there were really um, uh, six, two in the old language, four in new language. Anyway, one of those prayers, people called it the Star Wars prayer because the language was so distant from the thee and thou language they were used to. But it had a phrase, it had a sentence in which it thanked God for God's creation of interstellar space and all of that. And then it said, and for this fragile earth, our island home. And that's sort of what I preached about. But then there's a phrase, the next phrase is, and this is a problematic phrase, and I intentionally didn't touch upon this, you made us the rulers of creation. You made us the rulers of creation. And of course, that refers to the, to the I think, to the first chapter of Genesis. Um, and I, I wonder if you could explore some of that, because I think if we think we're the rulers of creation, then we have carte blanche, don't we? Um, and I wonder if you could explore that that sort of Genesis notion of, or what, what, what the text really says, um, but, but what it does when human beings think that God has made us the rulers over this other thing that is called creation. Yeah. Yeah. That's such an important point um, because it has shaped so much of the harmful ways that Christians have related to the environment. But even as we have uh, started to engage more thoughtfully in our relationship with the more than human world, it, that, that idea has, has still been central to, to much of the, of the conversation. Um, in some ways, it, it a lot of that attention goes back to an article from 1967 by a historian named Lynn White, who uh, wasn't the first person to make this claim, but was probably the most influential in, in his article to say that Western Christianity, and specifically in the creation stories, he said, is the most anthropocentric, that is the most human-centered uh, religion the world has ever seen. And so much of Christian environmentalism and environmental theology has been responding to that charge by Lynn White, because it's important, because as, as you say, um, for better or for worse, that really has, mostly for worse, has really shaped um, how we have understood our, our relationship to, uh, to the more than human world. There are a couple of, of different ways to approach this. So one is to really unpack the texts themselves, the Genesis stories, and to understand what things like dominion or till and keep, understand what some of those uh, lines and, and words may have meant in their original context. And uh, the biblical scholar Ellen Davis is really the best person for this. She, she you know, really unpacks um, the various nuances and the ways that even an idea like dominion wouldn't have meant the kind of straightforward exploitative practices that it has often been used to justify, right? So even looking at those texts themselves, um, what we have, have done with them has represented a misreading. But the other way to approach it is to just take those Genesis texts alongside all the other creation texts of the Bible. I think when we think of the creation stories in the Bible, we always think the two Genesis creation stories, right? That's where we always go. And, and that's somewhat natural, um, partly because they come first, right? They're at the very beginning of the Bible. But there's so much more that can be described as creation texts in scripture. And even and that that's just to talk about texts that sort of recount God's creation of of everything, right? So there are there are texts in the Psalms, in Job, throughout the Old Testament that that tell a story similar to the story told in Genesis, but with very different kind of emphases and implications. And then beyond that, there are all kinds of texts that have sort of environmental implications to them. And what you see when you look at the, the broader spectrum of these texts is a lot of different kinds of relationships to the created world. So as I mentioned, um, a lot of the texts about the covenant describe the role that the land and and things on features on the land mountains and trees and whatever um, may play in that covenant with God and there are all kinds of other texts that talk about mountains praising God and trees clapping their hands and um, where 
you don't have the sense of, of here are humans and here's everything else, but there's agency everywhere. And there's, there's all kinds of different understandings of, um, of how, how we relate to those things and also how they might have their own relationship to God that has nothing to do with us. Right. Um, I always love love the book of Job for for all of the implications that it has in this area, right? For for really putting us in our place, for 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 saying, oh, you thought you were at the top of all this, like you don't know anything, right? Um, so there's there's really a, a rich spectrum of creation texts and texts that have environmental implications, and so alongside kind of unpacking those Genesis texts, we also can pay more attention to all the different kinds of things, and some of them. Uh, some of them are, are, are kind of radical things that um, the whole of scripture has to say about that. You, um, so when you speak of, of the, the mountains leaping and the trees clapping their hands, it may, you know, in many ways it sounds very much, again, I have a very limited understanding of almost any of this, but it sounds very much like, um, an approach that certain indigenous Americans might have taken mm -hmm. uh, to understand um, much that there's much more animate than we might think is animate. And um, um, recently, my partner's nephew suggested that I read Braiding Sweetgrass, which you re refer to in your book. And, and it, it's sort of, it, you link it to different ways of knowing. You said the book is stunning. I think that's your word. Um, and then um, it's it's part of where you talk about knowing. And, and, and I think in, in our Western world, we tend to say that um, science is knowledge and everything else is just poetry, you know, as if these were distinct things. I wonder if you could talk about different ways of knowing, and in particular, how, for example, an indigenous way of knowing informs our environment, could inform our environmental ethic. And you also used earlier a phrase, more than human, which yeah. I think ties into the notion of there are humans and then what is all the rest of this? Yeah. Um, all right. So you've given me a few things to, to unpack and I don't want to miss any of it because it's, it's all really good. I'm sorry for all these compound questions. I'm really and sorry. If I, yeah, if I, and if I miss any of it, please remind me. I want to start with the last thing, the, the point about more than human, because it really, it, when you're writing a book, for example, about um, environmental theology, it's challenging to articulate what it is that we're talking about in a way that doesn't partake of that same kind of dominion mindset, right? If you say non-human, if you say the natural world, um, if you say, uh, you know, you, if you use any of the, the kinds of um, locutions that we have, have historically used, all of those have their own, usually kind of anthropocentric, again, human-centered um, kind of mentalities that they carry along with them, right? So, so there's no perfect way to articulate that, but more than human is one that a lot of people are, are, are relying on that at least um, gets your attention and, and draws your attention to, to, to all the various implications that, that are wrapped up in kind of that naming. Um, I also, to, you're, you're absolutely right to say that, that part of what I'm describing in the Old Testament is a kind of animism. And I wanna uh, call out another book by um, biblical scholar, Mary Yorstad uh, called, um, Environmental Ethics in the Hebrew Bible, I think is the title of it, but she really makes that case and she um, explores various examples of animism throughout the Old Testament to say that this was a very prominent kind of worldview uh, for many of the biblical authors. Um, and that's it's it's a really excellent, excellent book, really thoughtful. Could you see what animism is for those of us who may not do sort of religion as a for yeah. a living? Yeah, thank you. Um, so generally, it's it's the idea that um, other kinds of beings than 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 human beings may have spirit or soul or agency in some um, in some meaningful spiritual sense. And as as you say, that does have a lot in common with many indigenous worldviews. Um, your stat is careful not to to make any particular claims for them, but she does say like this is how we can compare. What we what we see in the Hebrew Bible to some contemporary forms of this, um, but yes, as as you as you said, uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer's braiding sweetgrass, um, I, I I can't recommend it enough. It's it's an incredible, beautiful book, and it really does engage with the qu question of 
knowledge of different different ways of knowing. But part of what is so beautiful about it is Kimmerer is herself a botanist. And so she's trained in scientific ways of knowing. And she's also a member of the citizen Potawatomi nation. But she actually kind of comes back, returns to those more indigenous ways of knowing and, and learns those after she has has um, studied science and biology and, and become versed in kind of scientific forms of knowledge. And so she, in her work, is able to see the limitations of scientific forms of knowledge without kind of completely rejecting that. She's able to hold uh, the kinds of indigenous ways of knowing and relating to the more than human world together with um, with scientific ways of knowing and and relating and to see really the value of both of those. And that's what I think is is crucial. Um, I think what her what her book is 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 partly claiming and and what many post-colonial, uh, scholars who think about this would argue is that a lot of what we understand to be legitimate kind of ways of knowing, legitimate forms of knowledge, science, um, more kind of uh, rational or kind of enlightenment um, ways of of knowing, privileges one particular type of knowledge, right? Uh, and it tends to be seen as sort of neutral, objective, rational ways of knowing. But again, that represents a particular perspective and leaves out all sorts of other forms of knowing, embodied, emotional, relational forms of knowing. And so what someone like Kimmerer is claiming is that um, we can we can hold those together in some ways. She, she doesn't choose one over the other necessarily, but she really weaves them together in, in some really beautiful ways. Um, and I think that that kind of work is, is crucial to... Um, to again, to sort of unpacking and and trying to to address the um, the ways that colonialism and and racism still kind of work their way into our environmental um, discourse and our, our environmental actions. I, I would think religious knowing is another kind of knowing that that generally I think you and I would say is real, but would generally not be admissible to, to many conversations. Um, in fact, I think tends to be actively discounted. Um, yeah. if, if, if we were either individually or collectively to accept these other kinds of knowledge as being valid, mm -hmm. uh, how would that change, do you think, the way we would approach the created order of which we're an integral part, not, not that created order, but the whole created order? What, what, do, what do we lose by not attending to those things and what might we gain if we did and respecting them. Yeah, I, I'm really glad that you raise the point about religious ways of knowing. And because I, I think it is in some ways um, holding, holding that together, holding more um, contemplative or prayerful or spiritual forms of knowledge together with reason and and more kind of rational ways of knowing is something that the Episcopal Church and the Anglican tradition before it have always really emphasized. Um, the Anglican moral theological tradition that I teach in, you know, all the way back in its in its beginnings has a place for for reason and a, a really crucial place for reason for our ability to think through these things, but sees that as of a piece with with our prayer, with our worship, with our our practices of caring for one another. Um, so yeah, I think uh, I think the Episcopal Church and and the Anglican tradition have a lot of resources for that kind of of, of holistic uh, thinking. And I think what that can do in terms of our of how we relate to the environment or to the created world, um, I think that it can give us more resources, more more kind of options for the kind of relationship that we that we want to have with the more than human world. It can it can allow us to to claim to make claims for contemplation, for um, for embodied forms of knowing, for work, for play, for um, kind of sensual experience of the created world. Another really crucial thing that it does, though, is turn our attention to 
um, as you already have, to some of those communities that have have been making claims for those forms of knowledge and for the different sorts of experiences for a long time. And this is one of the things that's central to my book is um, is showing some of the ways that in Christian environmentalism and mainstream environmentalism more broadly, uh, those have been shaped by a particular, again, a particular relatively narrow kind of experience of of creation of the environment. If we start to think about different kinds of knowledge, more embodied, more uh, more communal forms of knowledge, et cetera, we also start to uh, recognize the, the legitimacy and value of others' experiences, of the experiences of other communities, of, of Native American communities and other marginalized communities, of uh, you know African American folks in the U.S. Um, have have their own long, complicated history with how they have related to the land that mostly has not been a part of the story of mainstream Christian environmentalism until the last couple of decades. Um, so I think attention to those different ways of knowing, different ways of relating can also recall our attention to um, to the experiences that have been left out of a lot of this as well. Could you say more about this, about the 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 uh, experience of Black people in America and their relationship to the land? Because you said it's something that's only been recently addressed. So, yeah. So I, I'm um, I'm hesitant to say too much because I I don't want to want to speak for for folks um, with experiences different from mine. Uh, my friend Christopher Carter is someone who's written uh, among among many others, but. Um, the first name that comes to mind, someone who's written a lot about about this particular uh, subject. But I think the 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 ways that um, African American communities' experiences of the land, of course, begin that that history begins in slavery and begins in um, a connection to the land that, well, it doesn't begin in slavery, but in, in, in North America, certainly like that's, that's where it began. And that's, that's what it's indelibly shaped by. And so that of course creates a very, uh, complicated relationship with the land. Um, Christopher in his, uh, in his, in one of his articles talks about working with African-American students and in a community garden, and they were, um, say ambivalent about about the experience partly because they it reminded them of what they had learned about slavery um more recently since about the 1970s um the environmental justice movement began engaging environmental racism that is the ways that environmental uh, harms disproportionately affect communities of color some of what i talked about before with climate change but also with pollution, toxic waste, all of that. It's well documented that communities of color are disproportionately affected. And so in, in the 1970s, um, communities started engaging in real direct activism to try to resist those inequalities, those injustices. But only more recently in the last couple of decades have, have mainline predominantly white uh, environmental groups really turned to and and paid attention to the experience of those environmental justice movements and environmental justice groups as articulating their own distinctive, powerful, um, important connection and, and relationship to their places, to their to their lands. More recently than that, um, another scholar, Ilonda Clay, has, has made an argument that, okay, we've got the environmental justice thing, but um, there also is sometimes a tendency to reduce African-American experience to just that, as if that's the only way that those communities have uh, have in, in act, interacted with and engaged with environmental issues. And so she argues that there's a, a broader, richer kind of spectrum there as well. So all that's to say, these are experiences that have not conventionally been a part of, of what in the book I describe as mainstream Christian environmentalism until relatively recently. And that's um, something that is beginning to be addressed, but still requires a lot more work. We have about 10 minutes left. And and, and there's I, I, there's so much, this could really go on a very long time. Um, but first, I want, there, we've had two comments um, now, um, the, that, uh, the questions that, that seem to interrelate. One of them comes from um, a professor 
who says that um, when one of, one of the things she has her students do is to walk in a bucolic sort of place and relate to not more than human things um, in a more personal sort of way. For example, using human pronouns to refer to them and not the neutral it, and how our English language creates a category that most languages don't for for um, in a, I, the word that language is more than human parts of the of the creation. Somebody else asks, um, given how we've exploited more than human um, parts of creation, if there is restitution, it's easy to talk about restitution toward, it's not easy to do, but it's easy to talk about restitution toward people. But what about restitution to non-humans? And, and what about relating to non-humans in a more personal um, way, even in, with language? Yeah, those are both excellent questions. Um, the the one about language in particular, that is is something actually that Robin Wall Kimmerer talks about directly in, in Braiding Sweetgrass. She, she describes her experience of learning the language of Potawatomi, which does have that more kind of agential that, that talks about the more than human world in ways that uh, reflect its its agency, its action, its animacy in those ways. And she talks about how that changed her mindset. So that sounds like a wonderful exercise that that, that person is describing. Um, and I can imagine it would be really impactful. Um, and yeah, then I think the question of uh, what would restitution to the more than human world look like? First, um, I really welcome the question because as I said, I think part of, of what we have to do is um, get past the, we can't do that kind of uh, obstacle and start asking, well, what would it look like if we did, right? What what might that be like? Um, and there, are, yeah, it's, it's obviously a, a really challenging thing to try to address. Um, there are, you know, practically speaking, there, there are, are ways that we can be more attentive to and try to advocate for the more than human world. It, since we operate in political systems where they don't, uh, where, where most more than human beings don't have a voice, um, it falls to us to, to, to try to advocate for them, to try to represent them in some ways. Um, there also are, you know, a, a few limited examples of, of um, more than human beings being granted legal rights, being granted, there's a river in New Zealand that has legal personhood. There are stories of trees that are, are granted a certain kind of legal personhood. There's a whole rights framework that also represents an attempt to bring these, these species or these beings that haven't historically had any voice in, in our political systems, but to try to give them some direct political status, you know, so um, that too is, is, is a way of, of trying to begin to think about, about that question, right? So um, it takes some creativity, but I think, yeah, the first thing that it takes is, is just asking the question, like, what, what might that look like? And how does that get us out of our, our more conventional kind of um, lenses? We have about five minutes. And um, it, whenever you put two Anglicans interested, really interested in the church together, um, and and talk. The thing that has to eventually come up is liturgy. I mean, it just has to, right? Um, you in your book, of course, because you're talking to all of us. Eventually, you came around to liturgy, and um, I have to say that I found um, that section to be incredibly gratifying because you made only one suggestion in your whole worldview that one concrete suggestion about the liturgy, and that was the use of silence in the liturgy, which is something that we prize very much here at the cathedral. Um, so I wonder if you could talk about what this apophatic way of celebrating the liturgy, of having extended periods of silence, what, what in the world does that have to do with our approach to the environment? Yeah, thank you. Um, and I I think I make some other suggestions, but I'll agree with you that that, that was sort of my favorite. Um, I, I am my own personal spirituality is shaped by uh, Quakerism and um, I have family members who are Quaker and that's that's been important to me. And that's part of where I come to this appreciation for silence. Um, but it, it goes back to, again, to the question of, of knowing and ways of knowing. And I think um, 
creating more opportunities for silence and for really, as 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 we discussed a little bit before the um, before the webinar began, but really long, uncomfortable silences sometimes. Um, I think it it has the potential to to move us into other ways of knowing and experiencing God and one another, both one another human beings and and the more than human world, and to to make a a real claim for that as a as a kind of knowing and relating. Um, along with the Episcopal Church's high value for reason, uh, we have a lot of words too. And um, so I think in our tradition in particular, um, some space for that, for that silence to recognize that uh, there are ways of speaking and of not speaking about God that are both kinds of um, forms of knowledge. And that's really what, what apophasis and the apophatic tradition represents. Um, that, that is a way of uh, enacting a different kind of knowledge within our worship service. And uh, to go back to your point about liturgy, um, that too, I think, is something that is just deeply Episcopalian and Anglican, that uh, our moral life, and here speaking as, as an ethicist, um, our moral life, the way we engage with problems, whether it's environmental problems or, or any other sort of problems, is deeply tied up with the ways that we pray, the ways that we worship, um, the ways that we shape our communal life through throughout the Anglican and Episcopal tradition, that that kind of holism has always been crucial. And so I'm glad that you raised that that point. And I think how we enact some of these things and some of the creative possibilities for for enacting those in um, in our liturgy is is going to be absolutely essential. So I, I'm going to ask you the final question that I ask everyone. Um, um, as, and this will be the wrap up uh, for this series. And um, uh, I think that this has been a very valuable session because oddly enough, and I didn't expect this, it's touched on themes that have run through all of these conversations. It's sort of been a capstone and a synthesis kind of experience. And I'm, I'm very grateful for that. I'm also very grateful um, for your work precisely as a lay theologian. I think oftentimes in the church, we think of, if someone wants to give their life over to the to the to the life of the church, um, that the only way to do it is to get yourself ordained to the priesthood, and and I think that's that certainly is not at all true, um, especially given our ecclesiology. And so I really want to thank you for your witness um, as as a lay the a professional lay theologian. Thank you. But now I want to say something about. I want to ask you the last question. So in just a month, um, we will all. Go, some of us have already voted, but uh, theoretically in a month, we'll all go to the ballot box. As Episcopalians now, especially with an eye uh, toward issues of environmentalism, yeah. what 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 do we take with us to the ballot box? What sorts of questions do we Episcopalians have to ask? What sorts of convictions do we have to hold? Yeah. Um, so... I, yeah, a couple of, of related points, I think, that that seem essential to me. Um, one is something that I've touched on a couple of times, which is the the Episcopal and Anglican emphasis on reason, on, on the use of reason, and that that is a legitimate and integral part of the life of faith, together with scripture and tradition, that it's absolutely essential to how we live our faith in the world. And so that we are meant to to think deeply and critically about these issues, um, and that that faith, by no means, involves rejecting those those ways of thinking and those those sorts of claims, and even everything that I've said about the limitations of of kind of rationalist um, enlightenment rationality and 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 those forms of knowledge, is is not to detract from the the real necessity for that kind of critical thinking for that that kind of um, deep thoughtful engagement and that that's something that goes back again to the the earliest thinkers of of the anglican and episcopal tradition um another thing that's related to that and related to what you said about lay people um is that uh together in with with that in the, in the anglican tradition you have this firm commitment to um 
to people's lives in the world, to the to to people and to the the claim that um, you can live as a Christian in the world as as a lawyer or as a doctor or as a scientist or as a educator, um, and that the the witness of the church relies on those those sort of people, right? So the um, William Temple, the Arch, Archbishop William Temple in the early twentieth century was one of the best examples of this, that he believed that the church could articulate its principles and then it's up to people in their in their daily lives to to um, to use their knowledge, their expertise to to, to exercise those things um, to, to to carry out the church's vision in the in the world. And so um, I think those those two things go together for me, but a, a sense that of carrying that kind of um, personal experience and and critical engagement, critical reflection, uh, with you and in, into the, the way that you approach any of these kind of issues that that to me would be um, one of the key points that I would want to want to take away. Well, this has been both extremely fruitful um, and extremely pleasant, and I, uh, I very much appreciate the hour that we've had to talk to one another. Um, those of you who are joining us, I would encourage you once again to uh, this this um, recording of this webinar will appear in our YouTube channel um, and uh, you can watch it. You can share it with friends. I would especially encourage you to share it with your clergy and with people who do adult formation in your parishes. This thing could be a, a great way to help people uh, prepare uh, for uh, the election. Um, if in, indeed you have found this series to be useful. Um, if you could let us at the cathedral know how it's been useful to you so that we can imagine how to do these sorts of things going forward. So again, um, Dr. Thompson, I am grateful for you and for your work and for all the good things that happen at Suwannee. Uh, and um, thank you for taking this hour to be with us here. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Good. Thank you.